This is the word of the Lord. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Agai. Speak to Zebebel, son of Shetel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, a son of Zadak, the high priest, and to the remnants of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. And declares the Lord and the work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and, and my spirit remains among you, do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill the house with glory, says the Lord God Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. The, the glory of this present house would be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Almighty God. That is the word of the Lord. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much this morning because uh, there's a right time for every every season in your calendar, Lord. And in this season, Lord, you brought us the man of God uh, as our lead pastor, Ken Ochola, Lord. We just want to commit and dedicate him to you this morning, Lord. He has prepared, oh dear Lord God. And so we want to pray that the power of the Holy Spirit is going to speak through him to us, Lord. So prepare our hearts so that we can hear your word, oh Lord God, and be obedient to him. So Lord, we commit uh, Pastor Ken to you. Speak through him, O oh Lord God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. The Lord bless you. Why don't you give a hand clap to our elder, Estangaine? Bona Yesu Asifiwe. The Lord is good and all the time. Amen. We're going to be studying from God's word from the book of Haggai, chapter 2, from verse 1 to verse 9. The prophet Haggai is known as a post-exilic prophet. Basically what that means, it's a prophet uh, who came and was sharing God's word after the children of Israel had come from exile. And they had come from exile from Babylon. It, uh, the book of Haggai is also known as a minor prophet. Now a minor prophet doesn't mean that he came from central Kenya. Uh, a minor prophet simply means they're minor and they're major prophets. And a minor prophet is just simply the words of his prophecy were much less than those who are major prophets. And today we're going to be looking at rebuilding the glory. And we're going to be looking at rebuilding the glory. It's important for us to understand that this does not mean, and many times it's preached in many churches, which is false to scripture. It does not 
mean that we are now to rebuild our own glory. This does not mean we're here to build and puff ourselves up. No. What it means is that we're here to partner with the Lord in what he is doing to build a platform that would bring him glory. Now last week, Pastor Weru had shared with us from the book of Haggai chapter 1 and where Haggai had been challenging the people of Israel, now settling in the southern part of Israel, Judah, to start rebuilding the temple and stop building their houses. Now let me give you a little bit of a background as to why Haggai started this three-month uh, ministry that was very successful. I think it's one of the shortest ministries. Just three months, very successful. But Haggai is coming to speak to our children, a people of Israel, that had come from a very depressive background. Now, from the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 36, it starts talking about how the people of Israel, and actually before that, noting all these chronicles of how the children of Israel has started becoming rebellious. God blessed them and blessed them indeed. But just after Solomon, who God blessed immensely, extremely wealthy, blessed them in every aspect, the kings after that started rebelling. So the nation of Israel divided into half, the northern part of Israel and the southern part of Israel. The northern part of Israel started becoming more rebellious, started assimilating with all the nations there, started compromising on what God had asked them to do, and went extremely pagan. So imagine it's almost like, not in reference to Sudan, but it's almost like Sudan, northern Sudan and southern Sudan, one nation, or Korea, where there's North Korea and South Korea. So Israel in itself, the northern part, became extremely rogue. They didn't care. They started mixing with other gods, started doing pagan practices, started offering their children to the god ba uh, Balaam, started offering these children of theirs on actually a god that was made of bronze and putting children on those altars that were their hands and burning their children for prosperity. In fact, in history, it's said that they had drummers next to those gods. That even as they did that, the more the children wept and cried in this sizzling hot iron, drummers would hit the drums louder so that they wouldn't hear the children cry as they were burnt to death. That was northern Israel. Southern Israel was mixed. Good, bad. Good, bad. But toward the end, when God started prophesying and telling them, now you need to change or I'll let you go to your ways. The last king threw up his hands. This is 2 Chronicles 36. And God gave them over to the Babylonians and said, okay, if you want your way, here, have it. And so God brought up the Babylonians who took them into exile. Now, if you know anything and a little bit of church history, when people are taken to exile, they're not taken in a nice, polite way. They're not taken with police on the side, walking them and encouraging them, asking them if you want a drink of water, maybe we can help you, maybe we can stop here in case. No. People are put in shackles and chains, kill all the men who are alive, who can fight, kill older people, kill younger women, kill women. That's what they do. Put them in chains, those that they can handle, take them over. This is a journey that is over 200 kilometers in sizzling Medit <laughs> Middle East heat. They're being taken over. And God says, that's what you wanted? Here, have. And so they go to Babylon and stay there for a period of about uh, 70 years. They go there all that time. And so from Isaiah 45, as some of these, prophets, uh, these prophecies are happening, it's interesting how the book of Haggai is also intermixed with the book of Ezra. Um, uh, sorry, not Ezra. Ezra. Ni forgive. Ezra. Buona sifiwe. Hey. So as it's interlinked with Ezra, 2 Chronicles, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Isaiah, Isaiah prophesies in Isaiah 45, and it says God stirred up the heart of King Cyrus to let his people go. And so, not only does uh, Cyrus let them go, 
but he actually blesses them with all the gold that was taken from southern Israel and was kept in the vaults what the Babylonians had because King Cyrus was actually not a Babylonian. He was from the Medo-Persian Empire. This, the Medes and the Persians came, formed a coalition, said, let's take these Babylonians down. They took them down, and so they divided the kingdom. There was King Cyrus and there was King, who was from the Medes, but also known as King of the Persians. And they decide that they're going to rule over these people, but said, also, let's let them go. So all that the Babylonians had taken, they give to them. And so as they give the children of Israel and let them go and escort them back, Ezra is the one who brings them back, about 50,000 of them. In fact, the Bible says in uh, Ezra, hey, Ezra, what is going on today? Ezra, in chapter 1, that they were given about 5,200 articles of gold and silver. And so as they come in, they come to Jerusalem, they come to the southern part of what was Israel. They see how the city was because the city, when again, when people come and take over the city, they don't just come and take the people, but they burn walls, they take down buildings, they leave the place in a mess so that people cannot come back and settle in. So Ezra brings about these 50,000 people back. They come back and they look at the state of the land and they think, we can't settle here anymore. This is no good. So they try to build up as much as they can. And that's where Haggai chapter 1 comes in. Because the people looked at the land. They saw what was the temple. But they decided, you know what? Let's not concentrate on that. Let's build ourselves first. So they start building their houses. And like Pastor Wedru said last week, something odd happens as they're building up their houses. The Bible records in, uh, Ez in Ezra, and also especially in Haggai chapter 1, that no matter how much they invested, the investments went up into shambles. In fact, it said they have money bags, but it's as if they have holes. They invest in their land, they dig up their land, they try to make sure that their agricultural stuff is okay, but it always comes into a tremendous loss. And that's why Haggai comes into the scene and says, this is what the Lord is telling you people. And that's why the Lord is angry with them because they've been released. They've been given silver and gold to go back. Their job is simply to start the temple and to start it. But they say, mm -mm, temple, no, us first. And that's why the Lord gets upset at them and says, you people cried out to me. And the book of Daniel also records that because the uh, book of Daniel starts talking about what is going on in Babylon at the time. And God even prophesies to Nebuchadnezzar. God's God, God goes to an extreme of reaching out to them. And that's how merciful our God is. Imagine these people who have thrown up their hands at you. They say, you're no good anymore. So you let them beat their ways. But the person of who God is, is even as they're in their ways in Babylon, he goes into Babylon to rescue them. That's our God. He goes and even starts speaking to the leadership and says, let my people go. So they come back and they see these amazing things happen, even in Babylon through hardship. But they come back home and start doing with their own business. That's the background. And so the Lord is upset at them. But even as they start doing their background, it's also important to know why they started doing their own things. They came and found things that were not in order but they found people already settled in the land, the people from Samaria and even the Samaritans. So those are the people that are there. But when they saw those people, they became afraid and that's why they started concentrating on their things. Now when we're looking at the rebuilding of the temple in chapter 2, it's not rebuilding the temple the first time when they came back from exile and that's what's recorded in the book of Ezra chapter 4. That's not the first time. No, it's not that one. They started off, and in fact it says, let me read from you from Ezra. Please put your finger. We're going to be going through Ezra and we're going to be going through uh, Haggai, though Haggai is going to be our focus. Ezra chapter 4. This is, what the, this is what happens. This is what leads them into their selfishness. 
Ezra chapter 4 verse 1 says, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord. This is the first temple they're trying to build after exile. Building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel. They came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the families and said, let us help you build because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Eshradon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, you have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. Listen to this. They bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans. During the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Verse 6. At the beginning of the reign of Xerxes, they lodged an accusation against the people of Judah and Jerusalem. And in the days of Xerxes, king of Persia, Bishlam, Mithradeth, Tabil, and the rest of the associates wrote a letter to Xerxes. The letter was written in Aramaic script and in the Aramaic language. Rehum, the commanding officer, and Shishmai, uh, Shimshai, the secretary, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Xerxes, the king, as follows. Rehum, the commanding officer, and Shimshai, the secretary, together with the rest of the associates, the judges, officials, and administrators over the people of Persia, Uruk, and Babylon, the Elamites of Susa, and the people and the other peoples whom great and honorable Ashur, Ash, Ashur Banipal, that's quite a name, deported the, and settled the city of Samaria and elsewhere in the Trans Euphrates. Look at verse 12. The king, uh, the king should know that the people who came up to, came up to us uh, from you have gone to Jerusalem and are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They're restoring the walls and repairing the foundations. Furthermore, the king should know that if this city is built, its walls are restored. No more taxes, tribute, or duty will be paid. And eventually the royal revenues will suffer. Now since we are under obligation to the palace and, not it's, uh, and, not, and it is not proper for us to see the king dishonored, we are sending this message to inform the king. So this is in chapter 3 of Ezra. The first temple after Israel, they start building. So in Ezra 2 and 3, they are excited. They start uh, dedicating the work. They start going up and starting getting logs and timber and everything that is needed. The Assyrians, and that's where the Samaritans come, ask, can we help? You might ask, why do they refuse the help? But this is the issue. The Samaritans mixed practices. They practiced Judaism, but also the things that Israel, the northern part of Israel, has started practicing. Because the northern part of Israel, that's what they assimilated into. So the pagan worship, um, the temple prostitution, the burning of their children, they were still doing that. And that's why they said, we will not do this. You're not building this temple with us. And so those people say, aha. So they write a letter with falsities and say, King Cyrus, you're the one who led them. And they not only write to Cyrus, they write to, uh, there, is, there are two Cyruses, by the way. There is Darius and then there's Xerxes. They make sure all the kings know that if these people build, you're going down. Now these are just 50,000 people coming from a land of over millions. So that's why they get scared. And that's why in this very same chapter, chapter 4, Artaxerxes offers a letter and says, stop. Do not build. Before we go on, actually when I was reading this and I was studying this, I wondered, is this what's going on to us at Gesha? Where the Lord tells us, come, but things happen. People, some people swear that you will never build. 
And we're told to stop like we've been told. That's why we've been praying about our court case. Our court case is actually stop. I wonder if that's us. Nevertheless, that's why they stop. They're afraid. The people in the land make them afraid. They discourage them. Everything is set asunder. All that they had been given to build, they put aside and they say, let's concentrate on our own things. Now let's look at Haggai chapter 2. That's the background in which they came in. And that's why the Lord was upset at them. Because they chose not to trust in the Lord, but to trust in their own security. And I wonder how th that always happens to us. When the Lord sometimes tells us to trust in him for certain things, and that doesn't happen in the way we intend it to happen. And we start building up our own structures, our own foundations, our own things. And we tell God, thank you, Lord. I know you promised, but let, let, me, handle the, let me handle it from here. Lord, you're good. Just, just take a back seat. I, I can handle it. If there's anything, I'll let you know. Rebuilding God's glory. And that's where chapter 2 comes into play. When you and I are at a place where there's been massive discouragement. What do we do? What do we do in a manner that also brings God glory? What do you and I do? The first thing that I'd like to draw attention to here is rebuilding God's glory despite comparison. Let's go now to Haggai chapter 2 verse 1 to 3. In the second year of King Darius, now this is the second King Darius, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory. How does it look to you now? Does it seem to you like nothing? Why does God ask this question that almost seems like it's an issue of comparison? Some of the people who had been taken to Babylon actually survived and came back. In fact, in the book of Ezra, if you read a little long on, at this particular point in time, the people who actually saw this building being built, younger people are celebrating, older people are crying because they saw what the temple looked like when Solomon built it. There was plenty of gold. In fact, the Bible says in those days, gold and silver was common. And Solomon went all out. So as these people are laying this foundation, God asks this question. What does it look like to you? And sometimes we might ask ourselves in certain situations when we're discouraged, is God bringing issues of comparison or are we comparing ourselves to other people? I don't know if you've ever been at a part where you've been set and you want to do something, but there's always somebody who comes close to you and says, oh, are you doing this? I remember the first time I had the privilege of going to a private school. And the first time after a few years, people came and decided, let's meet together. It was about 15 years later. And people decided to go meet at this certain restaurant within the city that is high class. Let me not say which one. But Kenneth Ochola comes with a city hopper. And when I go in and people start talking, and they're like, hey, Ochola, how are you doing? How are you doing? And so people start talking and talking and talking and talking. At this time, I'm about 32, and people start talking about the houses that they've built. People, in fact, some people said, in, I have a car here and a few cars we want to sell. Oh, Chola, do you want to buy one? You notice you came with a mat. Matatu. At that time, I'd been trusting God for big things, and I still trust God for big things. Actually, my vision is the one that is set in Scripture. I want to leave an inheritance for my children's children. And I start looking and I say, Lord, what's going on? I thought, Lord, you're with me. And I start comparing myself to them. And guess what I do afterwards? When people are going, I decide not to go with them. I said, there's a few things I need to handle here. But then I was born again. Eh? 
But under the comparison, I put myself to shame and I decide that I won't face this and I start hiding. I don't know if you've been at a place of discouragement where you face a lot of comparison and you start hiding. In fact, the enemy uses quite a bit of comparison where you start comparing yourselves as other families, as other people, as other individuals. It might even be about your looks. It might even be about your accomplishments. There's a lot of comparison. But this is not the comparison that God is bringing here. God asks this rhetorical question, and when we'll see a little later on, he says, I'll even do a greater thing. During our times of rebuilding God's glory, there is definitely a time of comparison that will come, but the Lord says he'll do a greater thing. Will we trust him for this? In fact, I really feel bad for Zerubbabel and uh, Josiah, the people that are mentioned there. Zerubbabel, actually this governor of Judah, he's placed as governor because he actually comes from the line of David. He cannot be king. The monarchy was broken down, but he comes from that line. His grandfather and great-grandfather were extremely wicked and the people who caused this exile, part of the people. So imagine God is saying, rebuild this city, but you know in the back of your head, what did Guka do? This is what my grandfather did. And some people know, oh yeah, by the way, your grandfather was, yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah, you're the one. You're, it's in your family. You are the people, by the way. Joshua, who is a high priest, has never practiced anything in a temple. He's coming and they're setting up things where the Holy of Holies will be, where they're going to put everything that needs to be in the Holy of Holies and God's Shekinah glory will come. And they definitely have been told that if you're not worthy, you'll be struck down. Imagine how he felt. Imagine how Zerubbabel felt. Imagine how some of the children's, uh, children of Israel felt. There's a lot of comparison. If you are to start rebuilding the glory of God, that platform that will bring God glory, you need to stop comparing yourself to other people. You need to stop that. The enemy always uses comparison to break you down. He will always do that, always has, always will. Because he knows that once he does that, you start comparing, your focus moves from the Lord and moves to you and others. You start comparing. You start saying, look at how this other person looks. Look at what they have achieved. Sometimes I look at this and I was asking and I was praying and I was asking the Lord, what does this mean for us as NBC Westlands? Have we come here to Farasi Lane and are we comparing ourselves? Are we looking online and we're looking at other people and saying, mm, if we, if I, I wonder. Maybe you're in your own life and you're not at a place where you are or where you desire to be. Are you comparing yourself? You need to move away because that's a tool that the enemy will use to draw away that platform that the Lord desires his glory to come. We need to stop comparing ourselves. We need to stop comparing ourselves. And for us here at NBC Westlands, where a majority of us came from, NBC Ngong Road, no offense, Elder uh, Jomo. That's where we came from. That's where I was a youth member, by the way. That's where I grew up. We might start comparing ourselves to the new ministry center. I don't know if you've ever felt that. Okay, maybe you guys are too holy. Now, for me, <laughs> I look at our Sunday school and I'm like, oh, 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 oh. I start looking at the youth ministry and I say, what? Where we used to go for PPI Rusinga. What for us, oh, 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 this is an English speaking zone. Needs to be reminded to the children back there. We start comparing and comparing ourselves. Is this God's will for us? It is not. Verse 4, second, uh, Haggai chapter 2. The Lord says, But be strong, Zerubbabel declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all, the peop all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. 
For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. In our terms of comparison, and which brings me to my second point, the Lord reminds us that he is with us. And sometimes we need to hear that again and again. The Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. And some of the things that we're facing, there's a time where you just need to release and say, Lord, help me with this. Lord, help me with this. It's very interesting, I also find, that in the book of Mark chapter 9, where there's this father who comes with a child who is demon-possessed and comes to Jesus, the Bible says has an impure spirit. And as recorded from scripture, if you see how evil spirits behaved, some throwing themselves into fire, I'm sure this parent felt completely unable and tells Jesus, Lord, help me. I need this out of my child. But you know the interesting thing, when you read toward verse 24, let me read for you verse 24, you can read it later, Mark 9. Verse 24 says, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. I don't know if you're at a place where you've been told be strong, but you just don't know how to be strong. Do you flex muscles? What do you do when you're told be strong? Do you hide emotions? I know many times when I've been told be strong, that's the time. And you know, I, I, have you seen that habit, especially in funerals, where somebody's told be strong, be strong, be strong. You're mourning a loved one, but you're told be strong. I know I've been in a funeral. My dad's funeral was told, you cannot cry. You're, you're, the, you're a man. You're the man. But there I'm balancing tears. Tears are balancing. It's all mist in my eyes. But I'm told, be strong, be strong. So I started asking, do I flex? What do I do? I suggest to you, just like this father in Mark, sometimes when you cannot be strong, you just need to ask the Lord, Lord, help, over, help me overcome my unbelief. Sometimes you cannot do it, it's the Lord to do it. The Lord is the one who needs to step in into that situation. Paul in 2 Corinthians says this, chapter 12, verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you. This is the Lord telling Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's how you become strong. It's not in your semantics. It's not in your thought patterns. It's not in your plan. It's all in the, God, in the Lord's hands. I wonder if there are certain things that we need to release to the Lord and say, Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. If there are certain things that you just need to say, Lord, these things are constantly before me. Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. This is what the Lord was asking of the children of Israel. Where the Lord tells him himself, tells the children of Israel, for I am with you. I am with you. I'm the one who is leading this thing. I need your hands. You're going to build the platform, but I am with you. I'm the one who is going ahead. It doesn't matter what has been lodged to Xerxes on the other side. All those false claims that have been put, it doesn't matter. I am with you. It doesn't matter what they're telling Cyrus, the second Cyrus, who was a, who was a son of the first Cyrus, and they're telling him all these false things. It doesn't matter. I am with you. I wonder for you and I as NBC Westlands, if some of these court cases we're facing, we need to just let it go to the Lord and the Lord has said, I am with you. Because he said he's going to build his church and what? The gates of hell shall not prevail. And not only in these issues of the church, but also in your own lives. For the Lord says the good work that he began in you, he'll be what? Faithful to complete it. That's the God we serve. Brothers and sisters, that's the God we serve. And that's what we need to hear. That's the God we serve. I don't know if you are in the Mandamano on Friday with me. I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. 
And when you see some of these things happening in the land and you're wondering, Lord, what's going on? Do you and I believe that God can actually rebuild Kenya? Where he says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, he'll do what? He'll not only hear their prayers, but he'll do what? Heal their land. The Lord can heal Kenya, ladies and gentlemen. I ask that even as you look at the Mandaman on Wednesday, would you pray and say, Lord, heal this land? Because God did not create this land by chance. That's why God asks us to pray for our leadership. It's his will that we pray for our leadership. It's his will that we pray for our country. It's God's will. And these are the platforms that will bring glory to God. That when these things are fast struck, then when they're rebuilt, they'll say, truly this is the hand of the Lord. In Psalm 23, when David is saying, the Lord is his shepherd. But even in verse 4, when he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll do what? I'll fear no evil for the Lord is with me. His rod and his staff comforts me. Do you know when you're walking under a shadow, you need light for a shadow? When you're walking through the shadow, there's light at the end. That's what causes a shadow. So even when we are going through these things, the Lord is with us. When we're going through these dark paths, the Lord, our God, is with us. Amen? Our God is with us. And that's why we celebrate. That's why we go ahead and we decide we're going to build this temple even though things are not working out as they are. If things are not working out as they are in your life, I ask you, do what the Lord says. Go ahead. Trust him with it. Commit all your ways to the Lord and he'll make your path straight. Just do what he says. Just do it. In fact, Nike stole that logo. That phrase, just do it. No. No. The Lord is on. Just, just do it. Go ahead. I am with you. Verse 6 and 7, as we come to a close, says this of Haggai chapter 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth. The sea and the dry land, I will shake all nations. And what is desired by all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord says. And that's why he asks that rhetorical question. Did any of you see? Guess what? This is what I'm going to do. In your weakness, in your place of frailty, this is what I'm going to do. That is the God we serve. When God, rem God remains faithful. When we're faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot disown who he is. That's the God we serve. Even when we're faithless, he remains faithful. And that's why, just like that father, speak to the father and say, Lord, help my unbelief. Lord, help my unbelief. But it's important for us to notice something. In verse 5. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains among you. Do not fear. All of these things were based on the promise and the covenant that God made. These were all based on the covenant. When God promised that he's going to be faithful, he says he's going to be faithful. When God has made a covenant, he sticks to his word. When Jesus said that it is done, it is done. It is done. When we're told not to be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer and supplication, we make our requests known to God, it is done. That's the God we serve. That is why we need to rebuild this glory. I wonder if you're here today and I'd like to pray with you. 
and you'd like to just ask the Lord to work with you in these challenges, in these promises that probably you just don't see come into fruition. Or maybe you're at a place where you've seen them come and you want to thank the Lord. We'd still want to pray with you. would love to pray with you today. The God whom we serve is faithful. God is faithful. The Lord is faithful. He says in Matthew 7, even though you men who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more me, your heavenly father, who is good. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and who are crushed in spirit. If you are asking the Lord for healing for something, like Jeremiah says in 17.4, heal me and I'll be healed. James 5.14 says this, if you're unwell, call for the elders of the church to pray for you and anointing you, anoint you with oil. Let's believe God for these things. The book of Revelation chapter 12 also says the very same thing. That we have defeated the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the words of our testimonies. I think next week we need to bring Jerry Wakogi up to hear the testimony. We went to see the mom. The mom was healed completely. Something that was far gone. Some things that the doctors already started telling them, you need to start preparing for palliative care. You need to start preparing. You need to start putting things in order. We praise the Lord when we went there on Thursday. The mom said, hi, karibuni. In fact, she's the one who welcomed us to the chair. Said muizi kalia kitanda lakini karibuni mukai. The nurses at Coptic Hospital are still star struck. They're there looking. Hiya. Hatujui lakini mungu yuko. Yes, mungu yuko. Yuko. Bona sifiwe. Our God is with us. And even as we pray now, I don't know if you're trusting God for something. I don't know, maybe you are. In comparison, one of the children of Israel lived in disobedience, gone through some pretty hard stuff in your life, and you're saying, Lord, help me here. I don't know if you have a struggle in your life, and you're saying, Lord, this struggle is far too gone. Nothing can happen here. It's, it, it can't happen. I wonder if you're there, and the Lord is saying, come. I wonder if you're praying for a family member for something to happen, and things are just not happening. I wonder for us as NBC Westlands, to Mongana, Nema, Nema, Noah's, we are, the, in fact, we should now invite them to church, I think. They know us, the city come. These people know. Should we pray? <laughs> the Lord is able. That's what I'm saying. The Lord is able. And so if you're here and you want to trust the Lord for something, please allow me to pray with you. Would you stand up as a sign of faith? Even though things seem to be broken down, maybe... It's that second temple. Maybe you are here and you're saying, it just can't happen. Would we stand up to the Lord and say, Lord, I am willing to trust you. Is there anybody here today? Thank you. Father God, we glorify you that your amazing grace, your unlimited, unmerited, and deserved, and warranted favor is upon us. And that is what we're saved by through faith. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we rejoice this day because you have done it. For you are with us. Your rod and your staff, it comforts us. It comforts us. You are with us, Lord Jesus. Oh God, how sweet it is to us. How sweet it is to us. You are worthy of praise. And this day, Lord Jesus, we choose to clap and to celebrate and say, Lord, you are worthy. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. You who is able to restore Kenya, we say hallelujah to the Lamb. You who is able to restore that which concerns us, we say hallelujah to the Lamb of God. You who is able to restore our situations, we say hallelujah to the Lamb. You are worthy of praise. You are worthy of glory. You who is able to restore things that concerns NBC Westlands, we say hallelujah to the Lamb. You who is able to do that which concerns Nairobi Baptist's entirety, we say hallelujah to the Lamb, for you are worthy. 
And Lord God, we look forward to what you're going to do because you're able to do immeasurably more than we ask, think, or even dare to imagine. And so we lift you up this day and we recognize on this ninth day of July that Lord, through your word you spoke, we choose to believe you because you are with us. We glorify you and we lift you up. And this is our prayer and faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Lord is faithful. You may have your seats. God is faithful, ladies and gentlemen. He is faithful. God is faithful. Before elections, we prayed for peace. Didn't he grant us peace? The year before, we prayed for peace. Didn't he grant us peace? God is faithful. God's faithfulness is not pegged on our unbelief. He is faithful even when we're faithless because he cannot disown who he is. That's what he says in his word. And that's the God we serve. Buona Sifiwe. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you, people. The Lord is with you. Buona Sifiwe.